Chapter 1, Safety Guidance Survival is the ability of a seafarer to stay alive when life is threatened in a shipping casualty such as fire, foundering or stranding, collision, etc. when there is no alternative but to abandon the ship. The knowledge of the proper use of your ship's life-saving appliances is vital not only to yourself but also to your shipmates and to abandon a ship is a conscious decision that has to be made by the master only. The purpose of the course is to maximize the chances of survival through knowledge of the personal survival techniques, which have been developed to minimize the hazards of the survivors. Regardless of how near rescue services may be from the outset, Survivors must take action to safeguard against the immediate threats to life. Having done so, survivors should then consider the next greatest threat and protect themselves against that until a sequence of priorities is established. Without proper planning, only the lucky will survive. Principles of Survival First and foremost, protect against the hazards of the environment before starting to worry about you. For example, the correct use of distress signals. Thus it follows that protection has a higher priority than location. A person can survive many days without water and weeks without food. Both protection and location have higher priorities than food and water. Survival techniques are therefore considered under four main factors, protection, location, water and food. Remember, no one is a survivor until rescued. One. Muster List The ship's muster shall prepare and maintain a muster list before the ship proceeds to sea. The formal of the muster list for a passenger snip must be approved by the Department of Transport. On all ships reference should be made to the C's and M notices listed above when muster lists are being compiled. The list must specify The general emergency alarm signal seven or more short blasts followed by one long blast on the whistle supplemented by the electrical warning systems. The action to be taken by crew and passengers on hearing the signal. Other emergency signals and action to be taken by the crew, for example men overboard. On passenger ships, the location of passenger muster stations. Usually these will be the public rooms, so as to protect passengers from the weather. The name and rank of officers assigned to ensure that the life-saving and firefighting equipment are maintained in good condition and ready for immediate use. Substitute for key persons who may become disabled, taking into account that different types of emergencies may call for personnel with a variety of skills. The list shall show the duties assigned to individual crew members including Closing watertight doors, fire doors valves, scuppers, side scuttles, skylights and other similar openings. Equipping survival craft. Preparation and launching of survival craft CM-1207 Manning of survival craft which gives advice on the number of trained persons to be assigned to each survival craft station. Preparation of other LSA. Use of communication equipment. Manning of fire parties and special duties in respect to the use of firefighting equipment and installations. The list shall show the duties assigned to the crew in relation to passengers in case of emergency including Warning the passengers Seeing that they are suitably clad and have donned their life jackets correctly. Assembling the passengers at the muster station, keeping order on stairway and passageways ensuring that a supply of blankets is taken to the survival craft. Copies of the list are to be posted in conspicuous place including the navigating bridge, engine room and crew accommodation. Clear instructions to be followed in an emergency are to be provided for every person on board. Illustrations and instructions are to be posted in passenger cabins at muster stations and other passenger spaces informing them of their muster stations, how to don a life jacket and essential actions to take in an emergency. 2. Practice drills and muster. Each member of the crew is to participate in at least one abandoned ship drill and on fire drill every month. Drills are to be held within 24 hours of leaving if more than 25% of the crew have not participated in the drills on that ship in the previous month. On passenger ships, 
the drills shall be held weekly. On cruise liners and cargo vessels carrying passengers, they shall be mustered within 24 hours of the rembarkation. On cruise liners, the crews of the rescue and emergency boats should be mustered on the first day of the voyage, as soon as possible after sailing, and instructed and drilled in the prompt launching of boats and in the recovery of craft in the seaway. Similar drills should be repeated at intervals of not more than seven days throughout the voyage. Each abandoned ship drill is to include summoning of passengers and crew to the muster stations with the general alarm system and making them aware of the order which would be given to abandon ship. Prior warning of the use of the alarm system for drill purposes should be made to all persons on board. Reporting to emergency stations and preparing for the duties on the muster list. Checking that all persons are suitably dressed and have their life jackets correctly donned. Where practicable, the lowering of at least one lifeboat. Different ones at successive drills. Starting and operating each lifeboat engine. These should be run ahead and astern for a total period of not less than three minutes. If lifeboats are fitted with mechanical hand propelling gear this should also be examined and tested. Operating life or aft davits. Testing the emergency lighting. Each lifeboat shall be launched with its assigned operating crew aboard and maneuvered in the water at least once in every three months during a drill. Where it is impracticable for vessels on short international voyages to launch the lifeboats on one side because of berthing arrangements then these lifeboats must be lowered at least once every three months and launched at least annually. Rescue boats, other than lifeboats which are also rescue boats, shall be launched each month and maneuvered in the water where practicable. In all cases this latter requirement must be complied with at least once every three months. Where climatic conditions permit, the crews of rescue boats should wear their immersion suits when crafts are waterborne. They should also practice the recovery of an object simulating a person in the water. Chapter 2, Ship Emergencies, Types of Emergencies The ship and the seafarer can encounter many different types of emergencies. Many of them can be avoided by care and knowledge about the dangers encountered. That is why it is important not to expose yourself or others to dangers by sloppiness. Know your duties in an emergency. Be prepared an emergency can arise at any time. All knowledge and training gives you the best chance to cope with an emergency. Emergencies can arise from various causes, as for instance. Fire, explosion can arise due to failure or faulty operation by equipment, by Self-ignition caused by carelessness with open fire or smoking in the bunk. Collision can be caused by failure of machinery or rudder, insufficient watchkeeping or navigation faults. Grounding or stranding, like collision, can be caused by navigation faults, failure of machinery or rudder, bad weather or the ship dragging its anchor. Leakage occurs when the ship's null, deck or hatches are damaged. Icing can be dangerous for smaller vessels. It reduces the stability of the vessel, possibly resulting in capsizing. Man overboard. To rescue a person fallen overboard safely on board again, a fast and efficient action is required by the crew. All the above emergencies present danger to human lives, most of them eventually can lead to the abandoning and loss of the ship. A happy ending of an emergency implies that you too perform your duties with responsibility and care. General Alarm The general emergency signal consists of seven or more short blasts followed by one long blast on the ship's whistle and is supplemented by the electrically operated bell or chi axon which is activated from the bridge or maybe at some other strategic point and consists of a continuous sound of such duration as to ensure that this has been heard even at the remotest corners of the vessel. On hearing such signal you must put on your life jacket and proceed to the muster station, unless you have been given specific duties that is closing watertight doors, screwing down ports, etc. However such signal does not mean abandon ship. Although the lifeboats must be prepared and lowered down to the embarkation deck they must not be boarded. 
The abandoned ship order is given verbally by the master through the public addresser and any available loudspeaker. After the abandoned ship order is given, lifeboats are lowered into the water and the lifting hooks disengaged. Ship the tillers. Each boat will now be attached to the ship by the toggle painter and any crew left aboard should now enter the boat by means of side ladders or lifeline. The boat should then be hove clear of the ship's side using the toggle painter and passing it aft, hauling on the inboard side, at the same time making use of the boat hook to fan the boat aft. After abandoning the ship it is best to row or start engine and when well clear of the ship, search for any survivors. Then join up with and make fast to any other survival craft and remain in the vicinity of the disaster area for at least 24 hours, as rescue vessels and planes will proceed to the distress call position. Muster Lists, General In order to cope with an emergency situation in the best way it is necessary having planned ahead. The plans are called the muster lists and comprise the boat muster lists and the fire muster lists respectively, and in certain ships there may also be a man overboard muster list. Out of consideration for your shipmates and yourself it is your duty to acquaint yourself thoroughly with the muster lists think especially of What is my task? Do I understand what I do? Where do I have to appear? Where is the equipment to be used? Who gives the orders? To whom shall I report? What are the alarm signals of the ship? It is your duty to attend all musterings and drills. Your place on the muster list is either given by your profession, name, ship's number or room number. It is your duty to attend all musterings and drills. Your place on the muster list is either given by your profession, name, ship's number or room number. Lifeboat and Fire Muster List Knowing the proper use of your ship's life-saving appliances is important for yourself and others if an emergency is arising. You can improve the knowledge you already have by participating in the drills, by going through the training manual now and then by being aware of all matters in your daily work concerning the safety of yourself and the ship. This part of the training manual is about the complete safety and just like your own attitude towards the safety on board it forms the basis of the complete safety. Notice is called muster lists instructing each crew member what to do when an emergency shall be placed on board ships according to Salas. Among these notices are the lifeboat and fire muster lists and they can differ from ship to ship dependent on company. In addition, Lifeboat and fire muster lists will also differ dependent on type of ship and the size of the crew. There are certain general requirements to the contents of the lifeboat and fire muster lists and among these that they shall contain information as to when the alarm signals are used and how they sound. It is very important that all on board fully understand their tasks when an emergency occurs and this is why it is duty of every crew member to carefully study the lifeboat. and fire muster lists immediately after being mustered on board. To make sure that all on board constantly know their duties in an emergency, drills shall take place. It is during drills that things possibly not functioning quite according to the purpose shall be found and it is during drills you ask the questions you want to have answered. Remember, ask while there is time to answer. During an emergency there is no time to answer questions. Remember. It is your duty to participate in the lifeboat, abandoned ship, and fire drills and musters. Men overboard muster list. If a person fall overboard, it is important for his possibilities of survival that he is rescued on board again as fast as possible. The most frequent cause of death is not drowning but death caused by cold. To make sure that a person fallen overboard is rescued fast, Especially man overboard muster lists mob muster lists are found in some ships. These muster lists involve only a small part of the crew which in case of an overboard fall can launch the rescue boat fast and save the person fallen overboard. A special rescue boat is found in some ships, in others the motor lifeboats is used. The man overboard muster lists should be placed near the lifeboat and fire muster lists. Men Overboard Muster List 
If a person fall overboard, it is important for his possibilities of survival that he is rescued on board again as fast as possible. The most frequent cause of death is not drowning but death caused by cold. To make sure that a person fallen overboard is rescued fast, especially man overboard muster lists mob muster lists are found in some ships. These muster lists involve only a small part of the crew which in case of an overboard fall can launch the rescue boat fast and save the person fallen overboard. A special rescue boat is found in some ships, in others the motor lifeboats is used. The man overboard muster lists should be placed near the lifeboat and fire muster lists. Drills and Instructions as it is most important that the crew is prepared to act correctly in any emergency it is necessary always to be aware of what could possibly lead to an accident, because of that drills for various emergencies take place frequently and in order to supplement the drills with some more theoretical matter instruction are given about the various life-saving appliances. Safety Notices and Signals for the benefit various notices and signs are places at various locations on board, these can be notices about various rooms contents or contents of various containers and the like. Safety signs can be and should be divided into a system of mandatory signs, prohibition signs, warning signs, emergency signs and firefighting signs. These signs should be made in accordance with international standards and therefore where symbols, Pictures and drawings are used in lieu of text, making them more easily understood by all nationalities. Practice of muster drills once a month but within 24 hours from sailing if more than 25% of the crew are repatriated. Each abandoned ship drill shall include, 1. Summoning the crew and any passengers to the muster stations as specified in the preceding paragraph. 2. Reporting to stations and preparing for their duties. 3. Checking that they are suitably dressed. 4. Checking that life jackets are correctly donned. 5. Lowering at least one lifeboat after any necessary preparation for launching. 6. Starting and operating the engine. Different lifeboats to be lowered as successive drills. Drills to be, as far as practicable. Conducted as if there were an actual emergency at least once every three months each lifeboat must be launched with its assigned operating crew aboard and maneuvered in the water. Crew to be lectured on procedures for launching the life rafts and of the use of the line throwing apparatus and the pyrotechnics. Records. The date and time of each drill to be recorded in all logbooks. Bridge. R. T. Engine. Fire and Emergency Signal The life and emergency signal shall be continuous blast of the whistle for a period of not less than 10 seconds followed by a continuous ringing of the general alarm for not less than 10 seconds. Man Overboard Signal The man overboard signal shall be the letter zero sounded several, at least four, times on the ship's whistle followed by the same signal on the general alarm. Abandoned Ship Instructions 1. All persons indicated in the diagram on the left should use lifeboat 2. All persons indicated in the diagram on the right should use lifeboat 1. 2. Any extra persons should muster at lifeboat 1. Signals. Abandoned ship signal. The abandoned ship signal shall be at least 7 short blasts followed by one long blast on the ship's whistle followed by the same signal sounded on the general alarm. Boat Handling Signals All boat handling signals be sounded on the ship's whistle and shall mean the following. One short blast means to lower the lifeboats. Two short blasts means to stop lowering the lifeboats. Fire Alarm Signal A continuous signal on the ship's whistle not less than 10 seconds, followed by a continuous ringing with fire bells not less than 10 seconds, all clear signal. Three short rings with the fire bells. Second officer in charge of life saving and fire appliances. Meeting place one fire alarm, abandoned ship signal, at least seven short blasts followed by one long blast ship's whistle followed by the same signal sounded on the fire bells.
boat alarm, intermittent signals on the ship's whistle followed by the same signal sounded on the fire bells. Ship signal, at least seven short blasts followed by one long blast on ship's whistle followed by the same signal sounded on the fire bells. General Instructions 1. Each person shall familiarize themselves with their assigned location in the event of an emergency immediately upon boarding the vessel. 2. All crew members shall be thoroughly familiar with the duties they are assigned to perform in the event of an emergency. 3. Each person shall participate in emergency drills and shall be properly dressed including a property dawn life preserver or exposure suit. 4. In all vessels carrying passengers, the steward's department shall be responsible for warning passengers, seeing that passengers are have correctly donned their life preservers of exposure suits, assembling and directing passengers to their appointed stations, keeping order in passageways and stairways, controlling passenger movements and ensuring a supply of blankets is taken to the lifeboats. 5. The proper chain of command is indicated by the sequential numbers assigned to each department. Should a key person become disabled, the next senior member of that department shall take the disabled person's place. 6. The chief mate shall be responsible for the maintenance and readiness of all life-saving and firefighting appliances and equipment above the main deck. The first assistant engineer shall be responsible for the maintenance and readiness of all life-saving and firefighting appliances and equipment on the main deck and below. Fire and Emergency Instructions 1. Any person discovering a fire shall notify the bridge by sounding the nearest available alarm and then take all initial actions, appropriate. 2. Upon hearing the fire and emergency signal airports, Watertight doors, fire doors, scuppers, and designated discharges shall be closed and all fans, blowers and ventilating systems shall be stopped. All safety equipment will be prepared for immediate service. Alms numbers 9 and 10 shall check to ensure the item is completed after they report to their station. 3. Upon seeing a man overboard, immediately throw a life preserver, with a light attached if at night and notify the bridge by reporting man overboard port, starboard, side. In all cases keep the man in sight. 4. Any extra persons shall report to the hospital treatment room. Chapter 3. Abandoning the Ship General Records show that many ships sink in less than 15 minutes. This affords little time to formulate a plan of action. So careful pre-planning is essential to be ready in an emergency. Here are some sound pointers for you to remember when abandoning ship. Put on as much warm clothing as possible. Make sure to cover head, neck, hands and feet. If an immersion suit is available put it on over the warm clothing. If the immersion suit does not have inherent flotation, put on a life jacket and be sure to secure it correctly. All persons who know that they are likely to be affected by seasickness should, before or immediately after boarding the survival craft, take some recommended preventive tablets or medicine in a dose recommended by the manufacturer. The incapacitation caused by seasickness interferes with your survival chances, the vomiting removes precious body fluid, while seasickness in general makes you more prone to hypothermia. Avoid entering the water if possible, for example board David launched survival craft on the embarkation deck. If David launched survival crafts are not available, use overside ladders, or if necessary lower yourself by means of a rope or fire hose. While afloat in the water, do not attempt to swim unless it is to reach a nearby craft, a fellow survivor, or a floating object on which you can lean or climb. Unnecessary swimming will pump out any warm water between your body and the layers of clothing, thereby increasing the rate of body heat loss. In addition, unnecessary movements of your arms and legs send warm blood from the inner core to the outer layer of the body. This results in a very rapid heat loss. Hence, it is most important to remain as still as possible in the water, however painful it may be. Remember. Pain will not kill you, but heat loss will. 
the body position you assume in the water is also very important in conserving heat. Float as still as possible with your legs together, elbows closed to your side and arms folded across the front of your life jacket. This position minimizes the exposure of the body surface to the cold water. Try to keep your head and neck out of the water. Try to board a lifeboat, raft, or other floating platform or objects as soon as possible in order to shorten the immersion time. Remember, you lose body heat many times faster in water than in air. Since the effectiveness of your insulation has been seriously reduced by water soaking, you must now try to shield yourself from wind to avoid a wind chill effect, convective cooling. If you manage to climb on board a lifeboat, shielding can be accomplished with the aid of a canvas cover or tarpaulin, or an unused garment. Huddling close to the other occupants of the lifeboat or raft will also conserve body heat. Keep a positive attitude of mind about your survival and rescue. This will improve your chances of extending your survival time until rescue comes. Your will to live does make a difference. Action in the water. Avoid staying in the water for one. Longer than you need to. Body heat will be lost to the surrounding water more rapidly than it can be generated. This leads to hypothermia, cold exposure, unconsciousness and death. Wearing extra clothing will help delay the start of hypothermia. Get into the life or aft as soon as possible. When you are in the water, whether or not you are in the life or aft, try to stay near the boat. It may not sink and you may be able to reboard. If it stays afloat, searches will be able to spot it more easily than they can spot you. Staying close to the boat also keeps you closest to the position reported in your distress call. If you cannot get into a life or aft, do not swim aimlessly. Swimming increases heat loss. Remain as still as possible using flotation to keep you high in the water. Heat loss occurs much faster in water than in air, so the more of your body you can keep out of the water the better. Now it is the time to inflate the external bladder on your exposure suit by means of the mouth tube. You may be able to get on top of floating debris, a life buoy, a board, even a dead body, to help you out of the water. If you don't have an exposure suit, use the HELP heat escape lessening posture technique. If your exposure suit or PFD has a whistle attached, use it to attract attention. You may not be visible, but using the whistle will enable you to let others know where you are. If you have taken the time to prepare a personal survival kit, you may have other signaling devices that will boost your chances of rescue. Use them wisely. If possible, form a group with other survivors in the water. There is safety in numbers and a group is more easily located and more likely to maintain morale. Huddling together will also decrease heat loss. Boarding the raft from the water. Boarding a life raft from the water without help is hard. Pull yourself in head first using the boarding ladder and lifelines at the raft entrance to your upper body board. It may help to bob down and use the buoyancy tube. There should be internal lifelines to help you pull yourself all the way in. Try to pull yourself in with the boarding ladder and lifelines rather than the canopy, which could be torn by your weight. Getting an injured man into the raft. If one of your crewmates is injured and unable to help himself aboard the raft, pull him in carefully to avoid aggravating his injuries. Hold him so he is facing the raft, until you get his upper body aboard. Pulling him in with his back to the raft could harm him if he has a back injury. Once his hips are resting on the buoyancy tube, gently turn him until he is on his back and pull him into the raft. Keep him lying on his back until you have determined the extent of his injuries. Writing a capsized draft. One person can easily write a capsized draft if it is done soon enough, before a TTE canopy fills with water. Swim to the side marked right here. If there is no marking, Go to the side winch the CO2 cylinder. Maneuver the cylinder side of the raft so that it is downwind D. Then reach up and grab the riding strap. Strap by pulling yourself up into TTE raft. It may help kick your feet out as if swimming. 
If this doesn't work, try pull or see your feet or knees into the external lifelines dot to help you pull yourself up on the raft. Some rafts may write while you are climbing onto them. If not, stand on the very edge, where the CO2 cylinder is located. Lean back with all your weight and pull on the writing strap. If the canopy is clear of the water, the raft will begin to follow you. If the raft is large, it will land on top of you unless you spring backwards just as the raft begins to write. If the raft is land on top of you, don't panic. The bottom of the raft is soft and flexible and your head will form an air pocket. Stay face up, catch a breath of air and pull yourself out from underneath. If you try to swim out face down, your PFD or exposure suit could get hung up and make it difficult for you to get free. Riding a capsized raft with water trapped in the canopy. If the inverted canopy fills with water, the raft will be more difficult to ride. Put as many people as you can on the riding strap and try to pull it over. If you still can't ride it, you may have to cut a hole in the non-vulnerable part of the canopy, taking care not to deflate the canopy or the raft. Surviving a broad the life raft. If your boat is still afloat, Remain secured to it unless fire or some other danger means that you must cut the painter. There are two good reasons for remaining attached to your boat. It may not sink, and as long as it remains afloat it is potential form of shelter. If it sinks in shallow water, it may serve as an anchor for the life raft. Staying close to your boat keeps you closest to your distress position and makes you easier to spot both visually and on radar. If you decide to cut the painter, use the safety knife stowed near the entrance. Its curved blade is designed to avoid accidental damage to the raft. If there is more than one raft in the water, tie them together with a doubled rescue line. Again, there is safety in numbers. You will have more survival gear between the two, and it is easier to spot two rafts than one. If there are heavy seas, leaves adequate slack between the rafts. When rafts are tied by a short line in big seas, they tend to snatch, which may allow wind to get underneath and cause a capsize. Look for other survivors. The survival pack aboard the raft should include a flashlight that will aid a night search and serve as a signaling device. Look for lights or reflective tape on other life-saving equipment. Listen for whistles. If it is necessary to swim to a survivor, Use a safety line because the raft will drift faster than you can swim. If you have cut the raft free of the vessel, check to be sure that your sea anchor or drogue has been deployed. Life rafts can drift rapidly. The sea anchor reduces the rate of drift and assists the search by reducing your distance from your distress position. The sea anchor is deployed automatically on May rafts, and there is usually a spare pack aboard. Close the life or aft entrance when everyone is inside to keep out the cold and wet and keep in the warmth generated by the occupants. Leave only a small opening for ventilation. Post a lockout. Rafts are made so that you have the choice of pumping the floor up with air or not. This is because in tropical climates, the water under the raft will help cool the inside. In northern latitudes, regardless of the time of the year, you should pump up the floor with the hand pump inside the raft. Some rafts have seating positions which also must be pumped up by hand. Inspect the life raft for damage. If there are leaks, use the repair clamps. Take seasickness tablets as soon as possible. Even hardened sailors are probably going to get seasick on a raft, and seasickness results in loss of body fluid and incapacitation. If you have an apurb make sure it is working, see the section on the perbs in the previous chapter. Leave it on, don't switch it on and off or work the switch unnecessarily. If you have handheld VHF radio, transmit the stress messages to help rescuers home in on the signal. Any portable two-way radio available should be taken aboard the raft. The stress flares and rockets should be used sparingly, and only where there is likelihood of their being seen. See the section on visual distress signals. If they are sighted by a searching aircraft, it may be some time before rescue is at hand, but your location will be known. Treat all injuries. 
you must assess and treat injuries in accordance with the procedures outlined in the medical emergencies at sea, with one exception, you cannot perform the chest compressions required for cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, because of the soft floor of the raft. A suggested method of performing chest compressions is to place the victim on his back, on top of another groomman. The man on the bottom wraps his arms around the victim's chest, locks his hands and performs the chest compressions as if he is giving a bear hug. Where crewmen are recovered from the water apparently drowned, mouth-to-mouth rescue breathing should be started immediately and continued until help arrives, or you are too exhausted to continue. In cold water, below 70 degree Fahrenheit, near drowning victims have been revived after being submerged for as long as an hour because of a body response known as the mammalian diving reflex. It is the same response that enables whales and seals to remain underwater for long periods. Don't give upon a near drowning victim. Initial situation in the life raft. Immediately after abandoning ship and gaining the shelter of a life raft, survivors are likely to be cold, wet, exhausted, and suffering from varying degrees of shock. Mental and slash or physical letdown leading to collapse is likely at this stage, but you must maintain your self-control and your will to live if you are going to survive. At this point, you will be faced with multiple problems and you must decide the order in which you deal with them. Inventory and shelter are high priorities. You must be sure that all survivors have found the life or aft, and make it a real shelter by insulating it against the cold. You must treat serious injuries and seek to prevent seasickness. And you should examine the equipment and supplies carried aboard the life raft, and read the instructions for their use. If there are enough hands, several actions may be accomplished simultaneously. You must establish the priorities keeping in mind the seven steps. Remember that cold is the greatest killer. Every attempt should be made to pump or call out the life raft and to dry out the interior by using the sponges provided in the survival pack, extra clothing, etc. If your clothing is wet, remove it, wiring it out as dry as possible and put it back on. In general, clothing should be shared among the survivors, but take special care of the sick and injured. Waterproof or windproof clothing should be made available to those on lookout duty in the open. Once the life raft has been dried out as much as possible, make every effort to raise the body temperature of the survivors. This is vital in cold weather or when survivors have had prolonged immersion in the water. Keeping dry also helps guard against immersion foot, also known as trench foot. Close the canopy entrances, inflate the floor and have the survivors huddled together for warmth. The body heat of the occupants will raise the temperature inside the rafter and maintain it. Tests in sub-zero temperatures have shown that the temperature inside a life raft can be raised to 60 degrees Fahrenheit inside an hour. Leadership and Morale Good leadership and high morale are crucial for survival. Good leadership creates high morale, and the leader must take on the responsibility of keeping the other survivors as organized, calm and comfortable as possible. The vessel's officer will normally be the leader aboard the raft unless he is injured or missing. In some survival circumstances, however, unlikely leaders emerge. The leader should be the person who is in the best physical and emotional shape to establish priorities and maintain morale. If you are in charge, it is important for you to communicate with the other survivors. You must reassure them and assess who is best able to carry out vital tasks. Do everything you can to reduce fear and panic. Use the materials in the life or aft to show the survivors that there is shelter, means of signaling, water and food. Try to establish a sense of companionship and a firm but positive level of discipline. If you must deal with someone who has lost his emotional control, don't let him disrupt the rest of the crew. It may help to give him a nameless task. One survival instructor suggests rigging a fishing line with the weight end over the side and instructing the man to catch a fish. While the leader has the greatest responsibility, each survivor must strive to maintain a positive attitude and carry out the tasks which he is assigned. The survival of the group depends on each man's contribution, and it is here that preparation and training pay off.
a man who has foreknowledge of survival procedures and can focus his mind on constructive tasks is much more likely to make a positive contribution than one who has only his panic for company. In striving to maintain morale, don't forget that one of the seven steps is play. Establish the routine. The discipline of a routine not only helps ensure that vital tasks get done, but helps focus attention on the positive work of survival. The following suggestions should help you establish a routine. Assign one-hour watches in pairs, with one man on duty outside and one man on duty inside. 1. Outside. A. Look for ships, survivors, aircraft and useful wreckage. B. Flash the signaling mirror all around the horizon when there is sunshine. Someone else can see your mirror before you can see them. C. Look for a land. At night, listen for surf. 2. Inside. A. Maintain the life for aft, bailing, drying, ventilation, etc. B. Attend to injury victims. Maintain equipment. Keep rations. Keep the minds of the survivors occupied during waking hours, but don't overdo it. Avoid unnecessary work. Water use. Your body is about 70% water. Maintaining your body's water balance is a prime requirement for survival. Remember that water is a higher priority than food. You can probably live for weeks without food, but your survival will be measured in days if you have no water. Because the digestion of food drains needed water from your body, don't eat if you don't have any drinking water. Every bit of water you can serve, even perspiration, increases your survival time. While conserving water is vital, however, so is maintaining enough physical strength to cope with the ordeal of survival. Survival experts recommend that you begin drinking rationed quantities of water soon after boarding the life raft the amount depending upon how much you have been able to bring aboard. They suggest drinking one half of the daily ration at a time, rather than sipping very small quantities. Thirst may be reduced by chewing on gum, or practically anything else. However, this relief does not reduce the body's need for water. Drinking seawater will exaggerate thirst promote water loss through the kidneys and intestines and shorten your survival time. Under conditions of lack of water, urine is too toxic to drink and will also cut down your survival time. Alcohol will promote heat loss through the skin and water loss through the kidneys. Drinking alcohol under the conditions of lack of water is suicidal. Lash down all gear so that in case the raft capsizes or is swamped, nothing is lost. If a metal radar reflector has not been supplied, metal paddles can be used to reflect radar signals, but a raft is never a good radar target. Recovering survivors in a raft usually depends on visual sighting. Never waste your distress signals, flashlight batteries, etc. Distress signals should only be used with the permission of the leader, and only when there is a reasonable chance that they will be seen. Use the whistle and shout in thick weather. Use the sea anchor or drogue. Your life or aft should have a sea anchor or drogue, which is used to reduce the rate of drift away from the distress position, and thereby reduce the likely search area. The drogue is normally attached to a strong point on the raft and lightly lashed so that it is released automatically when the raft is launched. A spare drogue is usually stowed with the other equipment. It is essential to use the drogue continuously. Hence the drogue and its line should be inspected frequently. By varying the point of attachment, the drogue can be used to alter the position of the raft opening relative to the seas. The drogue can thus help you gain more shelter, or better ventilation. If both drogues in the life or F have been lost, every other attempt should be made to jury-rig another using whatever is available on the raft, for example, paddles tied to life jackets discarded clothing or a pair of trousers with legs tied and the waist held open. You may be able to use the section of the raft canister if it has been retained. Or a temporary drug can be made using two buckets and a heaving line. With the bite of heaving lean inboard, make and fast to the handle of a bucket, and around the bucket, 
for safety, and pay out one bucket on each bow. Until recently, life raft drogues have not been rigged with tripping lines, although such lines are now being installed on Coast Guard approved rafts. If there is no tip line and you need to increase your rate of drift, to clear obstacles to reach a landfall, for example, the life raft must be hauled up to the drogue, which must then be removed from the water. Chapter 4, Personal Life-Saving Appliances The personal life-saving appliances may be divided into three groups. Life buoys, Life jackets Survival suits Life buoys. There should be a certain number of life buoys on the platforms. The buoys should be made of a solid buoy and agent. A lifeline should be fixed round the buoy to make it easier for the person in distress to hold on to it. All approved buoys should be either white and red or orange colored, carry a reflecting band and the identification of the installation or ship. Some of the buoys carry a self-exhibiting buoy light which will burn for at least 45 minutes. The buoys may also be equipped with buoyant lines and or self-functioning lights and smoke signals. The smoke signals emit an orange-colored smoke for at least 15 minutes after the buoy has hit the sea. You enter the life buoy by putting both hands on the buoy and pressing it down and away from you so that it tilt over your head. Then place the buoy under your arms and wait for assistance. Stay calm. This will reduce the heat loss. If you throw it so that he can first seize the line, this is the easiest way. On drilling vessels and other mobile installations there should be at least eight life buoys equipped with approved buoy lights and smoke signals. The line fixed to the life buoy should be at least twice the distance from the sea surface to the platform deck when the ladder is in its highest position. General Requirements and Specifications for Life Buoys Passenger and Cargo Ships Life buoys should be so distributed that they are readily available on both sides of the ship and is practicable on all open decks extending to the ship's side. At least one should be placed in the vicinity of the stern. They should be stowed so that they are capable of being cast loose and not permanently secured in any way. At least one life buoy on each side of the vessel should be fitted with a buoyant line, equal in length to not less than twice the height at which it is stowed above the water line in the lightest seagoing condition, or 30 meters, whichever is the greater. Not less than one half of the total number of life buoys should be provided with self-igniting lights and not less than two of these should also be provided with self-activating smoke signals and capable of quick release from the navigation bridge. These life buoys should be equally distributed on either side of the ship and should not be the life buoys previously stated with buoyant lines. Each life buoy shall be marked in block capitals of the Roman alphabet with the name and port of registry of the ship on which it is carried. Passenger ships minimum number of life buoys. Passenger ships of under 60 meters. In length shall carry not less than six life buoys provided with self-igniting lights. Cargo ships minimum number of life buoys. Specifications every life buoy shall 1. Have an outer diameter of not less than 800 mm and an inner diameter of not less than 400 mm. 2. Be constructed of inherently buoyant material, it shall not depend on rushes cork shavings or granulated cork, any other loose granulated materials or any air compartment which depends on inflation for buoyancy. 3. Be capable of supporting not less than 14.5 kg of iron in fresh water for a period of 24 hours. 4. Have a mass of not less than 2.5 kg. Not sustain burning or melting after being totally enveloped in a fire for a period of two seconds. 6. Be constructed to withstand a drop into the water from a height at which it is stowed above the water line in the lightest seagoing condition of 30 meters whichever is the greater without impairing either its operating capability or that of its attached components. 7. 
if it is intended to operate the quick-release arrangement provided for the self-activated smoke signals and self-igniting lights, have a mass sufficient to operate the quick-release arrangement or 4 kilograms, whichever is the greater. 8. Be fitted with a grab line not less than 9.5 mm in diameter and not less than 4 times the outside diameter of the body of the buoy in length. The grab line shall be secured at four equidistant points around the circumference of the buoys to form four equal loops. Life Boy Self Igniting Lights As required by the regulations, self igniting Life Boy's lights shall a. Be such that they cannot be extinguished by water. B. Be capable of burning continuously with a luminous intensity of not high less than 2 cd in all directions of the upper hemisphere or flashing at a rate of not less than 50 flashes per minute with at least the corresponding effect of luminous intensity. C. Be provided with a source of energy capable of meeting the stated requirements for a period of at least 2 hours. D. Be capable of withstanding the drop test into the water from the stowed position or from 30 meters, whichever is the greater. Life Boy Self-Activating Smoke Signals As required by the regulations, self-activating smoke signals shall A. Emit smoke of a highly visible color at a uniform rate for a period of at least 15 minutes when floating in calm water. B. Not ignite explosively or emit any flame during the entire small commission of the signal. C. Not be swamped in a seaway. D. Continue to emit smoke when fully submerged in water for a period of at least 10 seconds. E. Be capable of withstanding the drop test into the water from the stowed position or from 30 meters, whichever is the greater. Buoyant lifelines, attached to IFE buoys. The buoyant lifelines attached to life buoys should be of a nature and structure which is non-kinking and have a diameter of not less than 8 mm, with the breaking strength of not less than 5 kg. Description and Method of Operation Operations The signal is normally mounted in the inverted position until required for use. A specially designed bracket is available for this purpose. One, at least one life boy on each side must be equipped with a line. Two, at least one half of the number of life boys must be provided with self-igniting light for a period of at least two hours. Three, at least two of the life boys provided with self-igniting lights also have to be provided with a self-activating smoke signal emitting a smoke of distinctly visible color for a period of at least 15 minutes. It must be easy to release the life buoys from the bridge. Most ships have a combines light and smoke buoys, a so-called man overboard buoy. 4. At least two life buoys must be provided with the float, a pole and a marking flag. Life Jackets only life jackets carrying the label approved by the Maritime Directorate should be used on ships and installations offshore. The label guarantees that the life jacket complies with quality requirements for example that the buoyant agent is made of a solid foam materials which is not ruined or damaged by sea water, oil or changing temperatures. The buoyant agent should be placed so as to bring an unconscious person into a correct floating position. In calm water the mouth should be at least 12 cm above the surface of the water. The life jacket should have an easily visible color and be marked with manufacturer symbols. The design must be of type that makes it difficult to put on in wrong way. It must be equipped with light reflecting agents, a security fixed whistle and straps to tie it to the body. There should be at least one life jacket for every person on board equally distributed to each lifeboat station.